Institute at the Robin School of Management at the University of Toronto. He has extensive experience in the consulting sphere um, for that working at what is now Kraft and Unilever, but also working at the Canada Consulting Group, the Boston Consulting Group, uh, working with private industry, working um, in the public sector, advising on all manner uh, of issues. Uh, what better person to talk about innovation, collaboration, leadership? Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Miller. conference and you're, you're all doing God's work and uh, uh, I hope it works out really well today. And what I want to talk about is a little broader, but I think um, uh, I think I'm trying to bring it back to technology and uh, and I'll make three points. One is that we have a prosperity gap here in Canada. I'll explain that in more detail. That prosperity gap is a productivity gap and that productivity gap is an innovation gap. And that's where you all fit in because technology is certainly a big part of innovation. It's not the only part of innovation, but it, it's certainly there. We, we would argue that strong management, general management, leadership collaboration, if you want leadership and collaboration, you need good, strong general management. That's an important element of innovation, providing both the pressure for innovation and support for innovation. And then finally, kind of the sad news, or the bad news, uh, the, the punch of this is that we are underinvesting in our management capabilities here in Canada, that um, we've got great technology, we've got lots of great science, lots of um, you know great R and D going on at our universities. But I think most of us would agree that somehow we're not connecting the dots. Many reasons why we're not connecting those dots. I'm just going to highlight on one this morning, and that is that um, we don't have good, solid general management capabilities to help connect those dots. First about our prosperity gap. So we compare Canada to other large economies around the world. So we, we argue that we have nine international peers. These are countries that have Canada, a third of Canada's population or more, 10 million people or more. So we can compare Canada to Luxembourg uh, or Norway, but those are very small countries uh, who don't have the diversity of population, the diversity of industry, and the challenges that we do. So how do we do relative to these countries in terms of GDP, gross domestic product, which is a measure of how much value added we Canadians are creating with our resources, our brain power, our capital resources, our infrastructure resources. How well are we doing creating uh, economic value added, which is um, GDP? Well, not bad. We are fourth out of those uh, peer group of countries. And uh, you know, we're, every year when we produce this chart, you know, it's kind of nip and tuck in how we do relative to the Netherlands, Australia. Uh, UK used to be closer, but they've kind of slipped a bit back. But we're in very good company at the at near the top of the heap. Um, but you can see that there's one country that's uh, $9,500 per capita ahead of us. And that's the U.S. And we all, you know, are saying, well, the U.S. has had its better days behind it. Um, it's, um, you know, it's on the ropes. Uh, we'll see that Canada's, you know, economic performance these days hasn't differed that much from the U.S. in terms of our of our output and our economic. Uh, uh, value creation. So uh, I wouldn't count the U.S. out yet. Um, I think there's lots that we can uh, look at them, um, especially in areas that are near and dear to your hearts around technology and around innovation. I think they're doing everything they can to screw up the economy there, but I think it's such a strong economy and it's got such an innovative capability that it's going to take a lot of effort for them to uh, to, to really screw it up. And so um, we continue to look at the U.S. We'll show you some comparisons to other countries as we go. Uh, but you might argue, well, look, uh, we're always going to be that far behind the U.S. Well, not exactly. If you take that GDP per capita number, just go back to um, 81, we were within spitting distance. These are all constant 2010 dollars. Um, we've opened up a pretty serious prosperity gap vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Now, is GDP just some economic abstract concept that only people like me care about? Uh, yes. Uh, but. It also has a real impact on people's incomes. Uh, we estimate, or by our numbers, this prosperity gap translates to about $12,000 per family uh, in personal disposable income. So that would cover mortgage payments, or rent payments, or their vacations, or RSP, or tuition. Um, we're leaving a lot of prosperity on the table here in Canada by not realizing what we would argue is our prosperity potential. We see no fundamental, you know, baked in our DNA reason why we should accept uh, that kind of prosperity gap relative to the U.S. 
Um, and then just in terms of, you know, there is a bit of smugness going on in Canada right now. Gosh, you know, our banks didn't fail, and you know, our unemployment numbers are better than theirs. All true. Uh, but in terms of what we're actually creating in GDP per capita, um, or in terms of, you know, our economic output, we haven't, our performance isn't that different than the U.S. Where we differ seriously and significantly is unemployment. So what the Americans are doing is they're getting economic output without workers, which I would not argue is the way to go. Um, but in terms of the economic output, uh, we are not doing a significantly better job than the U.S. Um, and so uh, we just, you know, and, and we all know how interconnected our economies are. It's very difficult to imagine a future where the U.S. economy goes down the drain and Canada just sails along uh, without being affected. So I think we're all kind of rooting that the Americans get their act together, but we also shouldn't at this end in Canada feel too strong about how great we're doing. Now, what we try to do is break the GDP per capita into four boxes, but I'm just going to kind of combine those first three, which we call labor effort or work effort. And that measures how many hours worked per capita are there. So we've got all these 35 million people in Canada. And one way to create economic value, well, the only way is to, is to work. Uh, get physical work, mental work, uh, but work. And so what we want to measure is how many hours work are we investing here in Canada uh, to create prosperity, to create uh, income and, and wealth. The other element is when we're working, that guy on the far right is productivity. When we're working, are we creating more value added per hour than our competitors and our counterparts around the world? And what we'll see is that this is the hours worked per capita. So back in the early 80s, back when you know, our GDP was kind of close to theirs, we were working as many hours as the Americans. We have better demographics than they do in terms of the number of our, the percentage of our population that's in the sweet spot of the 16 to 64. We just have more Canadians of that demographic who are able to work. We have higher participation rates, and we typically do have higher participation rates than the Americans. Our unemployment rate is typically worse than theirs, but right now it's, it's better than theirs. We have a better unemployment rate by one and a half to two points. Where we've trailed the Americans is in hours worked per worker. So when we're working on a job, more likely we're part-time than they are, and we're less likely to um, to work long hours, uh, so the upper tail in the distribution, and we're way more likely uh, to take vacations, to take week-long vacations than the Americans do. So the Americans are different than every other economy in the world. As economies get richer, people want more leisure and they work fewer hours, not the Americans, they just keep working away. So the net effect of all of that, though, is that we're working as many hours per capita as the Americans. You can see that uh, we've had, you know, we've been trailing them pretty seriously, especially through the 90s. The recession in the 90s was very severe for Canada, more severe for Ontario, and even more severe yet for Toronto. And that's where our prosperity gap really opened up was we were, you know, our unemployment numbers were through the roof compared to theirs. Our participation rate actually fell slightly behind theirs. Um, and so we did not have a very good um, economy, economic performance based on just people working. Um, but that's, you can see that, that gap is closed and now the gap is non-existent. And if you just Connect the two lines from 81 to now, there's really been no change in either Canada or the U.S. They've been up and down, we've been down and up, but we're back to where we started. So as we look to, you know, why are we trailing them? It's not this. It's productivity. It's the lower left-hand corner. So as we work an hour, how much value add do we create? And you can see that back when, you know, we were closer to the Americans in GDP per capita back in the early 80s, our productivity wasn't that far behind. But slowly but surely, our productivity, while well, it's been growing, it's not been growing as fast as theirs. And so to the extent we have a prosperity gap of the U.S. these days, it's a productivity gap. So when we have, um, when our workers, when you folks are working at your industries, at your firms, you're not as productive, I don't know about you personally, but your industry is not as productive as your counterpart south of the border. Uh, we uh, are not creating, uh, you know, differentiated products and services that we can charge premium prices for that we can produce as efficiently as, as our counterparts in the U.S. Now, I've probably lost some percentage of the audience already because they don't want to be harangued about Canada versus the U.S. So let's just go broader. Return to these nine countries that we, that we, uh, that we started with. What we show on the upper left is the same thing, only these are 2010 numbers at one, you know, one point in time. And you can see that in the upper left-hand corner, Canada, along with the other English-speaking countries and Japan, we work hours. We are work workaholics, or we just work more than the than those on the continent uh, of Europe. So we we work in Canada um, is right here at the top in terms of working 
know, how much we work in Canada. We know how to create jobs in Canada. We really are a job creating machine. So don't anybody uh, let, you, let you know tell you that Canadians don't like working or don't work. Um, we work. We're not very productive. Though. Uh, and that's the lower left. And never mind the U.S. Um, compare yourself, compare us to you know the other countries. And again, you then have to split. The English-speaking countries aren't so productive. The continental European countries are more productive. A lot of that's to do with their labor policies and their and who they allow into the workforce. So if you're unskilled uh, and young in France, you're probably looking at a 20, 25 percent unemployment rate. Um, so I think. You know, by design or just by the way it's turned out, in a lot of those European economies, if you're unskilled, you're not going to work. You're not going to contribute. And that's going to raise the productivity. So in some cases, a lot of this is just arithmetic. But Canada um, trails uh, in productivity, U.S. and most other countries. The U.S. is the only one that seems to do both. They work more hours, and their, their productivity is no slouch. And they're able to fire on both cylinders to get uh, prosperity. Lots of reasons behind this. Um, but I'm going to focus in on, on you know, start a bit about technology and then focus in on, on why management matters. Uh, this is just one element of our productivity gap versus the U.S. This is how much do we invest for a worker in machinery and equipment. Machinery, equipment, and software, it's called. This is the private sector. So per worker, we're falling behind the Americans. So we used to spend 79 cents for every dollar they spent back in 87. Now we're down to 64 cents. So for every dollar that your competitor is putting into technology, to machinery and equipment behind his or her workers, um, if you're a typical Canadian firm, you're putting in 64 cents. And I don't know if that's really a you know, winning recipe for, uh, for competition and for gaining prosperity. And if you split that, I don't know if the colors come out so good, but the, the light blue at the bottom is how much of that is in information communications technology, ICT. You can see much of the gap that we have relative to the U.S. is not in the traditional, you know, factory equipment and you know conveyor belts and salesmen's cars. It's more around technology. Uh, we invest less per worker, and that gap is widening. One of the things that we found in our research uh, is that one of the drivers of this is for a firm to make a good investment in technology, they need good managers. Uh, you need a manager, a leadership team who's got a strategy, who's got a vision and sees how technology is going to just totally change the business. It's not enough just to automate your, uh, your contact list or, or your receivables. Um, if you want to use technology, get the biggest bang for your buck from technology if you redo the whole business. We'd argue that you want some kind of smart management to be able to pull that off. Um, so I hope you bought into the notion that we have a productivity gap. Now I want to make the switch to say, when we say productivity, we're really saying innovation, or the two terms are almost synonymous. So when you read the newspaper and somebody's haranguing us about our productivity gap, don't, don't just flip the page or don't tune out. Just replace the word productivity with innovation. And why do I say that? Remember uh, this chart, and we'll just focus in on productivity. So productivity, value added, dollars value added. How much does your firm or how much does an economy create in, in, in value that people will pay for? Above and beyond the labor costs and the raw material costs. So value added numerator. Hours worked denominator. Well, we can make that number go up two ways. This will be the most technical part of my presentation. You can raise the numerator, or you can reduce the denominator. So we can get more value added out of our businesses. We can just find new products, new services that people will pay more for. Um, that's one way to get uh, your productivity up, is to raise your numerator. Or you can find ways to be more efficient. Get the same output, the same value added with fewer workers, with uh, fewer uh, you know, inputs. And that rate reduces the denominator. That raises our value added per, per hour work. Well, I argue, and most people who've kind of gone behind, well, what are the drivers of the numerator and the denominator? They're the same drivers of innovation. They're skilled workers, they're capable managers, they're scientific and engineering talent, investments in technology, vigorous competitors, clusters of people and businesses, and a balanced regulatory environment. If you're going to get a product, most people, when they think of productivity, they think it's, you know, efficiency. Let's just make machines run faster, let's see if we can lay off some workers. You can't make that work unless you change your process, and that's innovation. But I'd also argue that a better way to get productivity is to work on the numerator, which is to get more value out of products and services uh, that I can charge higher prices for, and, um, and that's the way to get productivity. And that's the kind of the gift that keeps on giving. You can only get your workforce shrunk so much. And in most cases, that doesn't work. Uh, the way to get innovation and productivity is some strategies of uniqueness, some strategies of differentiation that are going to drive you.
that's yeah. what innovation is. What is innovation not? It's not invention. I think you may, you may, you may have seen a piece in yesterday's book that Roger Martin did on the difference between innovation and invention. Invention is something that the inventor really cares about. It's new to the world. It's driven by the inventor's curiosity. It's based very much on science skills. Um, innovation is something that there's a demand for, that a consumer will pay real money for, that you're solving a problem for. Um, I mean, software code is really no good unless there's somebody out there who says, ah, this helps me with a problem, or this, this really provides a solution for me. And most innovation um, has got nothing to do with hard sciences and, and invention. Um, I mean, everybody's now going to be talking about Steve Jobs. Um, a lot of the innovation that Apple came up, certainly based on technology and based on new inventions and patents, but a lot of it was imagination and thinking through how the consumer operated and driving uh, you know, work teams together to solve these problems. And so the challenge we've got in Canada is that much of our policy has been based on invention. So I guarantee you in the November statement when, when Flaherty uh, comes out with it or in the budget next spring, when provincially and federally, uh, there'll be an innovation agenda. And then you look to see what are they doing. Oh, they're going to put tons of dollars into science and research, uh, more uh, R&D at universities. And that's great for invention, but that's not innovation. And so we shouldn't kid ourselves that a lot of what we're doing federally and provincially drives innovation. Uh, it drives invention. These are Canada's most successful companies. There are 42 companies who have a billion dollars more, more than a billion dollars in sales and are in the top five in their category, uh, however defined. So Harley Quinn's up there, the number one or number two romance publisher in the world. Didn't say these would all be high tech or that these would be uh, uh, you know, a cure for cancer, but we have 41 firms in Canada, large established firms who have uh, established themselves as a leader globally. And we went and looked and said, well, how did they get there? How did those companies get there? Did they invent something brand new or were they more innovative? And so we found that those 41 companies, 35 of them got their, 35, 36, sorry, uh, 36 got their purely through innovation. So Kushtar, you know, one of the five largest uh, convenience uh, store chains in the world, I don't think they invented a thing. They got there by being good inquisitors, by being good integrators of new, uh, of, you know, of operations that they uh, that they uh, bought. Uh, if you look at Cot Beverages, you look at Russell Metals. Um, they got there through traditional or through business strategies, through innovation. We couldn't find one company that got there purely through inventing something new. We actually found six who got there primarily who got there through both. So Bombardier certainly invented some new machines and new patents. But you can't argue that they got their strategy for that. Uh, they had invested in great uh, product innovation, um, and they had great um, you know, distribution strategies. RIM, the classic uh, case study, so Mike Lazaridis comes up with some great wireless technology. Jim Belsilli figures out how do we sell that around North America, and he recognized the fact that uh, cellular companies, cable companies, would really benefit if they could give their customers a cell phone because, and, a, and a Blackberry because uh, all the data uh, they would be able to charge for almost every month. Um, we couldn't find any company, as I say, who got there purely through, through invention. So innovation is really, really important, and it's really important to our, our uh, productivity gap and our prosperity gap. And let's not confuse it with invention. You know, the science and technology is very important, but it's, not, it's only part of the story. And I will now go through all 41 companies. Um, how do we get this innovation that we, that we want? Um, we argue that it's not just government support and you know, doing nice things to make our environment really um, you know, supportive of innovation. That's important. So we need to be turning out uh, great uh, scientists and great um, you know, technology people from our universities. Uh, we need uh, skilled investors. But we also need some pressure. Nobody does anything unless someone is, uh, you know, no one's going to come up with a new product unless the customer's demanding it or your competitors, you know, threaten to push out of business. You don't study anything if it's not on the line. And so we need uh, competitive pressure and we need more sophisticated customers um, to drive innovation. And again, our, our public policy, I think, does a decent job on the support side, but I think we just need to keep instilling more and more competitive pressure in our economy. That's why we're big fans of international trade deals, because we're such a small market in Canada, the only way we're going to get you know, world-class competition is if, if we import it. And so we're not only excited about opening markets uh, when we have free trade deals, we're also excited about opening you folks to competition. 
because um, competition is what uh, drives innovation along with professional support. Now, where does management fit in all of this? Um, we think management's a pretty important part of innovation and that management drives collaboration and leadership. To work with, to pull the resources together in a firm uh, to get us uh, the innovation that we want. Here's some research that was done by Michelle Alexopoulos. Uh, she's a, a researcher at the U of T. She first, her, her claim to fame is she, that she measures innovation and technology. She first started measuring technology diffusion by the number of books that were published. So um, there's a new SAP or new SAS uh, software. She says, we'll know that's being implemented if we see a lot of people writing books about it. And so she proceeded to count books on technologies going back to the 30s and the 40s. And, and then measuring, you know, as the number of books increase, which is a proxy for new technology, new innovation, did we see GDP increase? Did we see productivity increase? And, and we did. Well, we asked her, what about if you did that same technique with management? So as more books are written on just-in-time, quality circles, um, uh, management by objectives, uh, even going back to Taylor, uh, you know, can you see a subsequent impact on productivity and prosperity? as management gets better. And what she produced is the statistics that show that if you have a, a shock or a big increase in new management, you will see in the economy down the road increases in productivity and, and, uh, and uh, GDP. Now, she's a scientist, so we can't argue with this. This is the truth. Um, what it says is that management matters, and you just have to accept it. Um, we did some of our own work with Nick Bloom, who's a professor at Stanford, and what he tried to do was measure the quality of management that manufacturing establishments. So he developed a survey, worked with McKinsey, developed a survey that uh, you apply to um, manage, uh, senior managers at manufacturing facilities. We did the survey here in Canada. It's about a 30 to 45 minute survey. It takes forever. And it's a very open-ended questionnaire, so you're asking the, the people about, well, what are you doing around just-in-time? What are you doing about lean management, quality circles? Um, and really pushing them not to just take their hands and say, oh yeah, it's really important, but trying to you know, really get a sense of, did you really, uh, are you really practicing just-in-time? Have you really brought in all your, your, you know, your, floor, your, your shop floor workers into the whole process? And based on that, we're able to evaluate, give a score to each of the respondents. Nick was able to, you know, test uh, how good these, this scoring system was against things like uh, uh, sales growth, return on capital, and labor productivity. So what he was able to show that the better you have, the better score you have for management, the better, you know, things like productivity and value added come out of a firm. And so he was able to show that this is a decent instrument for measuring management, and that this management in turn drives good things in a company. And Canada does well. Um, these are, again, it's a similar chart to what we showed you with the GDP per capita. Canada uh, is right up there with Japan and Germany and Sweden in terms of manufacturing, you know, the quality of our manufacturing management, how well have we adopted and implemented lean management in our facilities. And again, we all trail the U.S. Um, now, you could take, this could be a good news or a bad news chart. I'll explain what's going on. The, the upper part is the distribution of responses in Canada. Uh, sorry, in China and India. Okay, so this survey is, is a bell curve that shows the, the, the responses, the average responses in China and India, and then below it you see Canada. And once you see Canada, what we hope to see, and we do see, is that Canada's further to the right. We, you know, more of our firms score well in this management survey. But the top 20% or 19% of those Chinese and Indian firms would be in the top half of Canada. So you could take Hartman and say, okay, you know, even. Uh, you know, we're better than most of the Chinese and Indian when it comes, Indians when it comes to manufacturing management, so we're, we're, everything's golden. Or you could say, oh my goodness, you know, one fifth of them were already in our top half. And I think we all can guesstimate or take a good forecast as to which way the Chinese and Indian distribution is going to move over time. It's going to move to the right. So perhaps this is a wake up call that um, uh, you know, China and India right now are not competing on the basis of innovation and management, uh, but I think they will be. And so it's, it's, a, it's a chance we're, we're ahead of the game. Um, let's make sure we stay ahead. Better managed firms in this survey had more educated management teams. And so I didn't show you the results for, we did a similar survey on the retail side where Canada's retail is pretty good relative to the US and the UK. 
But the thing to look at in this chart is as you move to the right, you've got management teams or operations that score better in terms of their management. So as you move to the right, you have better managed operations. The height of each bar is what percentage of those management teams have university degrees? And there is a relationship. I mean, education isn't everything, but it's not nothing. And so what we're showing here, what, what you can take out of this, is that if you want a better managed management team or a better managed organization, it pays to have a better managed, better educated management team. But when we look at Canada, and we look at Ontario, so these are what uh, the NOx code, the occupational code of a thing called managers. So these are, are people who make policy and organizations. It's about the top 10% or the 10% of, of, of all our workers that would be classified as managers. So they're not uh, uh, plan foremen or, or shift supervisors. They're managed, people who are making decisions and policies. And we're showing the educational attainment of those managers in Ontario, Canada, and the US. In the US, just take the top two boxes. More than half of their managers have a university degree. And here in Canada and here in Ontario, not a third, not, a, not even a third of our managers have a university degree. So if all you knew about two economies was this chart, who would you bet is going to be more innovative, more productive, more prosperous? I mean, I would argue that uh, uh, the guy on the right uh, with you know, a better educated uh, management cadre uh, has got a leg up. Now, we produce fewer educated people in Canada, and if you define educated people as university degrees, um, the black bar is Ontario total degrees per thousand population. Red is Canada, and blue is the US. So these are how many degrees were awarded in those years per thousand population. And where our big challenge in Canada is not so much at the bachelor's level, it's at the master's. So we, we get a lot of kids through university, but then we don't encourage them to go on and get a master's degree. And through other work we've done, masters and graduate education really does drive innovation and productivity. So this is one area where we, we could do better. But look at when you break it by discipline. Uh, so we hear that you know, not an innovation report comes out that doesn't say we need more scientists, engineers, mathematicians. Sure, we need more of those. But if you look at where our gap is relative to the US, it's that guy in the middle, the business management. We trail significantly um, in, in the number of business and management degrees that we turn out relative to the US. And I don't see a huge problem relative to the US in our science and engineering degrees. Now you'd argue, oh yeah, but the Americans are hurting too in science and engineering. Well, I think it was, it's arguable that they are the most innovative economy on the face of the planet, and they are emphasizing management degrees more so than science degrees. We have a big fist fight about, you know, is that, is that right? Uh, but I think there's something going on here that we, you know, we just need to be aware of. And it's not just MBAs, you know, I'm from the Robin schools, I'm not here making the case that we need more MBAs. We, we trail at the bachelor's level and, the, and at the master's level. Um, now, is that because our kids are different, they just don't want to go to business school? Well, no, that's not the case. We did some work with the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade, now Economic Development and Innovation, where they kind of acted as honest broker and they went to uh, the engineering school, the, the, the universities, and, 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 and gathered statistics on where did kids, um, where were kids accepted? So when you look at their first choice coming out of grade 12, um, who had the highest acceptance rates of kids' first choice? And arts and science had the highest acceptance rates. But look at engineering versus commerce. It's harder to get into U of T's commerce program than Waterloo's engineering program. So it's not because our kids don't want to go there. I mean, look at the march you need to get into uh, Queen's Commerce, like in the 90s. And I, I took Commerce in MBA. It's not that hard. Uh, it's not like this guy's going to be operating with people. Um, the, reason is, the reason is that our university administrators you know, restrict the spaces. Um, for some reason, uh, business is still kind of a second-class citizen on the university campus as far as uh, Spaces. And so it's just harder to get into these programs because there's fewer spaces available. And when government has stepped in to do special initiatives, uh, like the ATOPS program here in Ontario a few years ago, it's always around science and technology. So obviously science and technology is important. I wouldn't, I'm not making that case. I'm making a case for a balance. Very gap productivity, and that's innovation. Of that, our innovation gap, um, our innovation comes 
from many things, but one of them is strong management, and that we here in Canada are underinvesting and we haven't paid enough attention to the, to the management discipline and to having a good, well-educated, well-qualified, capable management cadre. And so as you, as you talk today, um, you know, I just urge you to remember that you know, we probably, you'd all agree that our technology is as good as anybody's. Um, it's why are we connecting the dots? And I'd argue that one of the reasons we don't connect the dots so well, the reasons our businesses aren't using and drawing on the technology as much as they could, is that the management needs to be uh, stepped up a notch. Thanks very much. Uh, now, we do have just a very, very few minutes if people had any questions immediately uh, for Jim. Uh, yes, please. Uh, we should have runners, but if not, I will try to show. So, um, no, I, I found your uh, your presentation uh, you know, very uh, challenging. I, I think and valuable. However, I think we missed this other piece of the um, innovation triangle. So it's not only technology and business ability; it's actually design and creative skills. And I guess I have this sort of frustration. Of, um, we go back at the innovation question again and again, and there's tons of evidence, including Industry Canada um, studies, including evidence from the U.S., from Europe, you know, the investment in Brazil, China, and India in design education, that, that creative knowledge, the ability to think outside the box, look at productivity from a systems level, um, think about new products, and frankly, what design provides is the ability to think about the zeitgeist, what consumers need and want that they don't even know about yet. Um, and if you look at Apple's success, you know, it's that ability to predict, it's elegance in the experience, um, and it's also the ability to look at a broken system like the music industry and say, how can we combine great technology, you know, what the consumer wants in a completely new way of addressing the consumption of music. iTunes, lots of billions there. So, I guess I'm just at a kind of breaking point around how long we need to keep saying it's all about either educating business people or educating technologists, and that technology savvy designers are left out of that picture. Thanks. So, it uh, wasn't so much a question, I think, but a comment on kind of uh, the, the impact of, of the design element as part of the, the technology experience. Uh, any other questions for Jim? Uh, are you more of a, oh, sorry, Chris. Please. Thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I have um, a question about the importance of what's called the hybrid manager. We're talking a lot about leveraging technology, and particularly in this forum, we're talking about ICTs. And a big, big problem is not only you know, developing management skills, but you know, nurturing managers who can speak the languages of both management and technology who can go and bridge the gap between these two worlds and actually leverage technology in a way that would benefit business and push it forward, align technologies with the objectives of any businesses, both at the micro and the macro level. For, for the, like, the ICD uh, cluster itself and the other clusters in, in Toronto and Ontario and Canada. Thank you. I agree. Um, I think you need management who has a decent idea about a strategy for the organization, is able to incorporate design principles, and understands the technology. So, uh, one of the charts I showed you was not had nothing to do with what kind of degree they got, whether or not they got a degree. So, I think someone who's got a degree in, in uh, medical studies or, or, or English or what have you. Um, you know, the fact that they've, they've spent the four years to get that degree says something, or they've learned something, they've learned how to learn. And so I think those people have a, as much a proclivity to master the technology as anybody. We've looked at the, the highest tech of the highest tech firms in the U.S. Um, and looked at who were their CEOs. And there's very few scientists and engineers who are currently running those firms. There's, there's lawyers, there's, there's uh, 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 Carly uh, Pierona was uh, medieval studies, I think. I mean, there's so there's a variety of humanities and arts and sciences that are that are running these organizations. And I think our point is that we just need to step up the capabilities a bit so that they can understand the technology. They don't need to be technologists. Uh, okay, last question. Sorry, uh, and we'll have to move on. 
you know, you, you did some studies and so on and so forth. One of the things uh, I see a lot of small businesses and startups, and they always complain that their gadgets cost so much more than the U.S. But what cost more? Their gadgets, you know, whatever uh, technology gadgets they're using. So that's a deterrent for them. Mm -hmm. So did you find some of that in your study as hampering the degree of productivity in the country? Well, I guess I, uh, this room will know more than me, but I would challenge the premise. There. Are the gadgets that much more expensive here in Canada, especially as the Canadian dollar is getting so strong? I mean, one of the benefits of a strong Canadian dollar is technology has gotten cheaper because most of the technology that we buy is imported from the U.S. So we might, uh, there may be great hue and cry about the um, how the dollar is screwing our manufacturing industry, but it's also making technology a lot more cost, you know, more affordable, and we have not seen a huge pickup in the investment in technology uh, amongst our uh, Canadian firms. But as far as whether or not um, uh, it's more expensive here, I haven't looked at that, and um, I, I didn't realize, or I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if it is that much more expensive. But I, the I don't know if it's the guy as much as the data plans. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, thank you very much. I really appreciate you picking us up this morning. There's a lot, I think, of questions that we're still milling around there. I'll encourage you to bring those into your uh, discussions later today, and hopefully uh, Jim can kind of be the seed for uh, a lot of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim. So I want to